Okay, we ought to be streaming now. Wait for a second as usual. Stream catch up. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Yes, we're live. Um, welcome back, everybody. Day four. Uh, uh, time flies. Uh, well, I at least I I assume it's been flying for you. It's it's actually even even in spite of 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 uh, uh, the the effort of sharing, it's been flying for me too. Just because I've been having so much fun getting to see all these getting to see all these talks. This is really a a kid in a candy store, uh, four days for me. So, um, thank you all for, uh, for being back for, for day four, uh, as per usual, we'll be starting with a keynote, our last keynote address. Um, really excited to be able to, uh, to introduce to you, uh, Sabina Leonelli, who I'm sure many of you know from the University of Exeter, where, uh, where she's professor of philosophy and history of science, co-director of the fantastic Igenis Center, the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences, um, and someone who's been doing really just, as I, I think I said in a, in a promo thread on, on Twitter, just absolutely unmissable work, uh, it's a required reading on uh, the role of big data in science, the way that data has been changing the production of scientific knowledge. So I'm really excited to, uh, to think now a little bit about how we can rethink HPS through the lens of digital studies of science. So please take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Charles. It's really a great pleasure to be here. It's a fantastically exciting event and it's really wonderful to see these different communities uh, coming together and talking to each other at last. So thank you very much to you and all your team for putting this together so effectively. And I think uh, one of the things I'm particularly loved about the conversations over the last few days is the fact that they really push to the fore some of the social aspects of science and particularly the study of communication. And um, many of the talks I've heard, unfortunately, didn't manage to hear all of them because I was teaching too uh, this week, but many of the talks I've heard have really focused also on some meta-level aspects of how scientists communicate, how we as researchers communicate, and I think that's partly what I'm going to be focusing on also uh, in my talk. And uh, one of the things I really should uh, premise my talk with is the fact that we're going to change gears slightly here. And this is because uh, I'm not going to be talking as much about uh, wonderfully quantitative work, but I'm going to be talking about qualitative work I've been conducting, uh, looking at what uh, people are doing in different scientific domains when they're working with uh, large amounts of data. And so it will be a meta level. Um, account and I guess is going to bring back also at a meta level uh, the importance of um, bringing together qualitative and quantitative aspects when we are doing digital studies of science. Uh, there's been many talks of course that pointed to this but I think mine is going to be another step in that direction. So uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking a little bit about some past work that I've been doing uh, looking at um, dimensions of data intensive research. Then I'm going to be looking at some of my uh, current research topics and then look a little bit into the future and see uh, what of the things that we've been learning through these studies may be applicable um, as a reflection for all of us here who are involved in this kind of work. And uh, Many of these thoughts I will start to hopefully uh, unravel as we go along in this kind of big tour of different projects and uh, different ideas and different initiatives. Um, but hopefully by the end, we will have enough thoughts that we can have a good discussion. So um, first of all, uh, I have been doing uh, quite a lot of work uh, in the past on the um, role of big and open data within the sciences and the interest that prompted uh, that kind of work were the fact that, for instance, the consideration that data has acquired a new status within research, and I think um, the very existence of this meeting proves that. It has become something that becomes publishable in, in their own rights. Um, it, there is in renewed attention to try and reuse available data and try and decrease the waste of data or the loss of data. Uh, a lot of attention, of course, to data-driven research planning and discovery, uh, to the role of semantics and standards in enabling the movement of data and therefore uh, their reuse. And of course, to use data in machine-readable formats to fuel AI and artificial intelligent tools. And this has been accompanied by the emergence of um, new institutions and new modes of dialogue around the use of data. 
to some extent, this is really at the moment allowing us to reinvent or at least to rethink how we exchange scientific results, how do we make inferences from the results, and how do we collaborate uh, across different disciplines and countries. And of course, um, data and data sharing questions have always had that power within the sciences. This is certainly not um, a new phenomenon, but the ways in which, uh, for instance, the discourse of open science is now being mobilized and the structures and the um, interest and the ways of financing that sharing at the moment are very particular. One of the things that has also become uh, very topical to think about in this, um, in this era is how do we um, incentivize and reward these kinds of um, shifts towards a more data-driven or data-centric uh, way of working, and how do we uh, go beyond the hyper-competitive uh, uh, publishing climate that we've all grown up with, uh, where whether you're in the humanities or in the sciences, there is a premium put on people who spend less time uh, tinkering with data, uh, tinkering with data and uh, thinking about ways to productively collaborate and more time in producing uh, sole authored or first author publications in high level journals. And of course, more broadly, there has been an attention, there continues to be an attention to how this new emphasis on the role of data can become an opportunity to improve the relationship between science and society. And in fact, can become a platform to debate what counts as science in the first place, for instance, whether technical work is actually part of scientific work, um, what is the role of scientific infrastructures in knowledge production, and the role of scientific governance, of course, and how results should be credited and disseminated in the first place. So uh, my focus since uh, many years now has been on trying to think about how big and open data become mobilized and uh, whether looking at the ways in which these data are mobilized tells us something about how comprehensive, how reliable uh, these data are and how they could be reused. And of course, it's a, a very widely shared presupposition for anybody working in contemporary AI that uh, the AI needs to be grounded on data that are shared across different contexts and can be reused for a variety of purposes. Um, and this is a major challenge, of course, uh, particularly when we're looking at large, complex and heterogeneous data sets, which have been put together by linking many different locations and many different sources and research done on different phenomena, uh, without even talking about the interest that, that um, the diverging interest that can uh, underpin such research. And so in trying to understand these issues, I've been doing a lot of work on what I'm calling data journeys. So the ways in which data get mobilized across context uh, to try and understand these challenges. So uh, one of the ways in which I've been doing this, um, I'm sorry, some of you have seen this slide before, but just to summarize is to look at how data move, first of all, from sites of data creation to sites of data mobilization that can typically be any kind of data infrastructures from databases to repositories, data banks, et cetera, et cetera. And then to sites of data interpretation. And I've been particularly interested in data journeys where the sites of data interpretation actually differ from the original sites of data creation. So I've been uh, focusing my work philosophically and empirically on how data need to be decontextualized to be able to be mobilized in particular ways. Data cannot travel with absolutely any information that uh, accompanies their um, production. But typically, there is a selection of which bits of information may be relevant um, about data provenance may actually be relevant to their potential reuse. And uh, this process of decontextualizing data is really crucial uh, to putting together data resources. And of course, many of you have provided wonderful examples of this already in the last few days. Uh, but very importantly, this process of decontextualization typically happens and certainly needs to happen, in my view, with already an idea in mind, a vision for what potential recontextualization could happen with the data. So what would be needed so that people who are based in different locations and, uh, and have a different background from the people who have originally produced the data can um, fruitfully reuse the data and do that in a way that still makes the data set reliable and does justice to the efforts that were produced in uh, generating the data in the first place.
So um, in doing this, um, some of this work has started by looking at how data get mobilized in model organism communities, which are uh, large communities of researchers, typically very highly distributed around the globe, who, uh, however, focus on the study of particular organisms. Uh, I devoted lots of work on uh, the distribution of data and the reuse of data on Arabidopsis thaliana, and this is a little graph that shows you different elements that are involved in the journey of such a data and uh, the reuse of data through uh, particular um, uh, databases and platforms. And I've been paying attention specifically to the relationship between data platforms and types of data reuse, and the ways in which the original samples and specimens uh, from which data were uh, garnered were stored. So this would be stock centers for organisms. And in the case of plants, it would be seed centers and seed banks. And also I've been looking in a lot of detail and continuing to study this uh, at systems of um, semantics. So how do we frame keywords, terminologies, concepts, assumptions that are underpinning not only the ways in which we are sharing data, but the ways in which we are um, uh, recontextualizing them. So uh, what assumptions are linked to uh, the um, dissemination of data, uh, what keywords, what ontologies are used, computational ontologies uh, to disseminate this data, these have a huge, um, huge implications uh, on uh, the systems that we're using and the ways in which they've been reused. And uh, in doing that, I uh, paid a lot of attention uh, to the fact that what we're looking at in these kinds of systems is fundamentally a type of distributed reasoning. Uh, we are looking at systems where there's potentially thousands of people who are indirectly collaborating, different groups of people uh, who are working on different infrastructures, different um, data resources, different types of repositories. Uh, they relate to each other because the data that they're uh, caring for link to many other different types of data and services which are available in the wide data ecosystem. But very often these people are not working directly together. They may not know each other. Typically they don't know each other. And um, so, and, and yet each of these groups of people uh, in a sense is custodian for one essential um, element within this data infrastructure and the ecosystem that is important in trying to understand uh, the ecosystem and um, what kind of meaning uh, this whole system is assigning to the data. Right? So we're looking at a situation where there's no single individual here who can really understand the whole system. So it's a fundamentally distributed system. And this has, of course, fascinating implications in epistemic terms for how we're thinking about knowledge, but also in ethical terms. And so um, I've been very interested in the last few years in also thinking about uh, what does this distributed quality of data infrastructures mean in terms of accountability relating to uh, people's work on this system, which of course is very relevant for us in SPS, because the question becomes when we're starting to put together data infrastructures and to think about specific kinds of data reuses and visualizations, what does this contribution to the ecosystem of knowledge and data um, in this field actually contribute to future work? And in which way are we accountable for the quality and the reliability of uh, the kinds of data infrastructures and interpretations that we're putting out? And of course, this relates uh, to an extent to the broader controversy around reproducibility, which is raging in scientific fields. I really wonder how many of you would think about this question in relation to your own work um, in digital studies. And of course, we can come back to this question, hopefully, in discussion. Now, um, one of the uh, more specific case studies I've been looking at is how does one uh, think about data linkage? So the idea of uh, making different data repositories interoperable with each other so that they still are independent from each other, they can still be used autonomously. But if somebody is interested in trying bringing together data sets that sit across these repositories, then it's actually possible to do so. And I've been looking specifically at um, situations where you're trying to implement data linkage in databases that are uh, targeting data taken from non-humans and databases that are targeting data taken from humans. And in fact, uh, one of the interesting cases I was looking at is the use of data taken from yeast, uh, which you would um, 
argue is a rather humble organism compared to the complexity of the human body. And uh, these data were in fact being reused for um, cancer research in human. Um, one of the things that I not noticed uh, at that point being extremely important in cases such as this, when you're doing a rather complex passage of data linkage is, um, oh, sorry, is the extent to which um, the responsibility for um, a, the um, data curation and the expertise used for data curation and annotation are distributed and what this actually mean in terms of trustworthiness of the data infrastructures that are therefore produced. Um, again, one of the interesting things I kept noticing is that um, these issues were much more easily handled for um, databases that still may um, comprise a lot of data, but were managed by relatively few people and were addressing a relatively self-contained um, community. So in the case of fish and yeast, for instance, this is a, a scientific community which is relatively well contained, still contains uh, a few hundred researchers, but they tend to more or less know each other, at least by name. Many of them are related through genealogy, they've been trained in the same labs, and that actually uh, provides a cohesion to the data, data collection method. It also meant that it was pretty much the only community I've worked with where there was a 50-50 split between a curation of the database taking responsibility for annotating the data and uh, people that actually are producing data taking some responsibility for how they would appear in the database and contributing some crowdsourcing um, to the database. Another case that we've been looking at, and this was with Nicola Tempini, my collaborator here in Exeter, was the case of how does one uh, use databases for um, a, in a complex field, which is a translational field, as a site for a trusted expertise that allows you to then immediately put this data into action in a very concrete manner. And this was the case of um, cancer genomics and the role played by database like COSMIC, which is a database uh, devoted to uh, somatic mutations in curating data from a very wide variety of sources, from publications to um, experimental work and making them available to people working at the interface with the clinic and personalized medicine so that uh, this data could in fact be actioned into a um, the production of clinical diagnostics and eventually also the diagnosis of individual patients. Another uh, example that we looked at uh, is the very, very important role that thinking about uh, information security can have when producing trustworthy uh, data infrastructures. And uh, to look at this, we worked with the Secure Anonymized Information Linkage Data Bank, which is based in Wales. This is one of the most prominent um, data banks, certainly in England, arguably in the world, which is dedicated, uh, at least ostensibly, to the anonymization of uh, very sensitive health-related data. So what they've been doing now for almost 20 years is to uh, garner data coming from uh, uh, medical practitioners, uh, data coming from cancer registries, from clinical trials, and from individual research projects, and um, bring them all into their um, uh, data system and anonymize them at different levels of anonymization as required uh, by the level of sensitivity of this research. And this, in fact, made it possible for researchers that were interested in reusing that data to actually go to this data bank and make an agreement for how they could reuse the data, um, even if it was such sensitive data and therefore um, very, very difficult to handle. One of the things we found here is that uh, the information security system set up by an infrastructure like this ended up having a very, very strong epistemic role in addition, of course, to being infrastructurally very important to actually allowing people access to the data physically. What these systems uh, manage to achieve is to provide and maintain a reliable chain of evidence when it came to the reuse of this data. And in fact, uh, very often people involved in this data bank ended up providing assistance to researchers that were interested in reusing their data in reframing their own research questions, in thinking about other data types that may be relevant uh, for those questions, and therefore really becoming uh, an integral part of the research effort, rather than just being people who take care of storing the data somehow. 
Another example we looked at, uh, which was particularly fascinating to me, uh, was the attempt, uh, which is uh, commonly referred to as a data mashup, to bring together data from very disparate sources in full awareness of the fact that this generates all sorts of epistemic problems because the communities that produce this data are operating on very different assumptions, but with the idea that if one can find some uh, parameters that are common to all these data sets and assume to some extent that these parameters are invariant, then it actually makes sense to try and just smash this data set together and try and see what kind of inferences one can make out of them. So the case we looked at was the case of a so-called MedMe uh, project, which was a platform that was putting, bringing together environmental data, health data, uh, socioeconomic data, and climate data uh, in the attempt to try and allow for, for instance, the mapping of uh, the spread of seasonal diseases in England and how this would affect health services and the provision of hospital beds, for instance. And what we saw here was that on one end, this was predicated on the idea that things like the measurement of locations of patients and also of uh, the spreads of um, potential um, pathogens um, could be pinpointed rather accurately. And so by um, juxtaposing data sets that apply to the same location, you could actually start to see interesting correlations, for instance, between um, the amount of patients that were um, being hospitalized because of any kind of pulmonary or respiratory disease and uh, the type of um, weather conditions and the type of pathogens present in the area at that point in time. What we found here is that actually this invariance, which sometimes can look so obvious like location, but of course time, as we all know, is that another big one, uh, are in fact highly varied. There are almost infinite ways of measuring locations. And uh, many of these ways are instantiated in these kinds of data sets. And so researchers busy in this project actually took an inordinate amount of time to reanalyze and curate their data uh, to be able to actually uh, provide reliable inferences. And again, this speaks to the incredible amount of hidden manual very often work and the kind of judgments and informed judgments that are uh, necessary when putting together these kinds of very large uh, data resources. Um, I also looked at the question of how does one um, automate some of these issues and uh, specifically the ways in which imaging data are now being automated in uh, research on plants. And that um, brought us to think a little bit more about what does it mean to relate data to models and to which extent uh, data actually are representing um, uh, parts of the world and to which extent are, is the modeling of data actually responsible for doing this. I'm not going to get into much detail about this now, uh, but you know, my position is that actually data do not represent at all, uh, but it's data models that are doing the representational job. Uh, but this was certainly another very interesting window into the huge complexity and the enormous amount of constant calibration needed to produce imaging, um, even in a situation where uh, the conditions under which imaging is produced, like in this case, uh, one of these uh, automated experimental um, stations, are highly standardized. So uh, what kind of lessons did we le learn from some of this work? Well, certainly we learned that the technical know-how uh, necessary to um, uh, manage data at this kind of scale is to some extent elusive and certainly represents a whole new set of uh, skills and expertise, and I'm sure many of you will agree with me, having done quite a lot of this work, uh, which are very, very difficult to um, bring together at the same level with the other types of expertises that uh, are needed for this kind of work. And indeed, again, we come back to this problem of this being highly distributed work, where you need people who actually have specific expertise on data management and what be best practice may actually mean in a particular domain. Um, here, um, for instance, we just made a kind of very broad typology of the kinds of data portals that people working in plant science really should be at least aware of when they're thinking about managing their data. And as you can see, it's a very long list and the specific examples of each of these typologies will vary very quickly in time as um, some infrastructures become uh, come out of use and others are invented. And so it's actually very difficult to keep up with these kinds of um, developments. But at the same time, of course, you also want to have people who retain uh, the um, domain knowledge that is absolutely necessary to be able to contextualize this data. <laughs> 
Um, we also, of course, uh, ended up thinking a lot about what kind of incentives are underpinning this kind of data ecosystem. And we found that uh, the incentives at this point are wrong and, in fact, uh, very worrying when it comes to uh, the robustness of the ecosystem. Uh, there is, of course, a lack of recognition for data creation and donation, and that limits the amount of data and metadata that are actually available online. And that again means that the kind of data collection that we can find online are uh, representing very highly selected data types from a very small proportion of available sources. And again, uh, we've seen that time and again in previous presentations um, this week. I mean, thankfully, in the case of HPS, I think everybody is trying to be very careful in really qualifying uh, the extent to which their original sources can speak to broader issues. But of course, there's always this creeping problem of representation um, when doing this kind of data analysis, like the wish that the data that we are analyzing in the first place could actually provide a bigger sample of the world than what we are actually have in our hands. Uh, there's also generally a lack of business models to try and develop and update, especially update online databases. And this in, time, in turn uh, limits the comprehensiveness, the usability and the reliability of the contents. And so uh, one of the things that we kept finding, we keep finding all the time, in fact, I think, that, uh, I think things have gotten much worse over the last 10 years, is that the selection of data used for particular um, research domains and questions is based on convenience, on the tractability of the data themselves, on the socioeconomic conditions of data sharing, for instance, when people um, insist on using Twitter data because it's much easier and it can be done to some extent for free rather than using, say, Facebook data. And, and these are uh, not really epistemic choices and they're not necessarily methodologically justified choices. And of course, um, the fact that we don't really have yet uh, review structures and criteria to value this work within academia in general, and I think again, this also impacts the HPS community to a large extent, it uh, means that again, we have worries around the quality of data that we're using and how trustworthy the infrastructures that are being set up are, given that people are not really acknowledged for doing a good work uh, with them very often. And uh, generally, we also saw a lot of um, misalignment between the IT solutions that um, engineering um, domains are offering and the research needs of people who are trying to um, put data to work in the field. What this meant is really thinking about the digital landscape as a highly fragile landscape, where there is an exponential growth of uh, data quality concerns, the sustainability of the landscape that we're uh, working with is really unclear and is certainly limited. And uh, this, of course, also connects to the fact that um, data travels and data journeys are constantly reshaped um, by institutional, national, disciplinary, cultural boundaries. And at the very same time, they challenge those boundaries all the time. So we are looking at a landscape that actually is very highly dynamic in all sorts of ways. And this, again, it makes it very difficult to um, keep it uh, well maintained without uh, proper resources. And of course, uh, this also goes for the sustainability in a more ethical sense, because protecting the rights of individuals and communities which may be affected by data reuse requires both local investments, but also a long-term shared vision for what it means to actually care for the data subjects that we are uh, dealing with in our work. Uh, there's also, of course, a, a risk of conservatism when we are kind of keeping reusing the same uh, data sources. And uh, what loom large, looms large, certainly in the uses of data in the sciences, is the fact that the vast majority of data, certainly in domains like the agricultural domain, but also in the health domain, are private, privatized or commodified in, in various ways. And that um, means that they are either inaccessible to people working for publicly funded institutions or they're actually just um, very difficult to um, handle and very expensive to handle. So let me say something about the kind of work that I'm doing at the moment that I've been doing in the last year or so, uh, which builds on some of these insights and tries to apply them in a variety of different ways. So um, one of the things I've come to realize, at least in my own uh, little uh, corner of the field, is that uh, one of the things that science and technology studies people have been saying for decades, and I think in uh, this audience, we all pretty much give for granted. So the idea that um, you know, what we're looking at here is a socio-technical problem. It's uh, an issue where 
technical considerations, conceptual considerations are completely intertwined with the social conditions under which they are uh, taken and achieved. And so I realized that this really uh, was not in any way acknowledged um, in, a, in any particularly um, deep way when it came to the setup of many data infrastructures and approaches to data linkage and data reuse. And so I decided to try and focus a little bit more on one of these areas and think about how specifically plant data are now being linked between different infrastructures around the world and try and see whether all the discourse which had followed quite closely around the standards, the semantics and the technical features of the software and the systems used to try and enable this kind of data linkage was matched by an attention to the social implications of linking this data and the uh, ways in which this data actually cross uh, national boundaries, the ways in which this data in fact belong to particular heritage traditions, and you know how this set of consideration was in fact intersecting with uh, the technical realm. And so uh, we started this project called Film from Data to Global Indicators as part of the Alan Turing Institute um, projects to look at how plant data can be reliably linked to those data infrastructure around the world and how this can be done responsibly. So uh, here's an example of one of the cases that I've uh, looked at already since a few years. I did my uh, field main uh, field study of this case in 2017, and I'm now uh, working with people um, based in different parts of uh, this case uh, to uh, try and further this. So this is a, a field in Nigeria at the International Institute for um, uh, Agriculture in Ibadan, uh, close to Lagos, um, in the south of Nigeria. And this is one of the main um, world institutes for sustainable agriculture, and is one where um, a lot of data are collected on crop trials, including in this case, um, a, a trial on cassava, which is a root you can see it here in this picture. Um, which is um, a very important uh, food staple for much of uh, the population in the global south. And um, what we're looking at here is the ways in which data collected from these kinds of field trials on different varieties of cassava end up informing research on cassava variety and um, improving uh, cassava to be more resilient to uh, the environment and to plant pathogens, but also the commercialization of cassava uh, is actually uh, implemented. So um, one of the things that I looked at in a lot of detail and collaborated with is the uh, development of the crop ontology, which is a system, semantic system uh, that um, captures information about plant traits. And you see an example of this here. This is a particularly big um, a cassava root. And these are the type of terms associated to some of the plant traits in this case. And also looking at the ways in which these kinds of information and this kind of criteria for what people should be looking at when they're collecting data are implemented through the use of field books, uh, which um, uh, researchers and technicians on the ground can actually uh, use to collect data directly as they're going across the fields and as they're uh, looking at newly uh, dug uh, cassava roots and then exporting directly in a kind of open data manner to servers that when they'll uh, disseminate this data all around the world, as I'm indicating here. So from Nigeria, and of course, there's many, many other um, uh, trials of this type going on around the world, these data are immediately made available to all sorts of institutions that are working on these same issues and to uh, both commercial and public organizations that are interested in this. So uh, what have we learned here? Well, I mean, in keeping with the questions and the issue around how this is really a social technical issue, what we learned is that the um, idea that many people have in this field, that one should try and produce some sort of environmental intelligence, so try and use AI to um, um, uh, monitor environmental conditions and try and um, produce better results out of the interaction between humans and the environment, including agriculture, uh, that this idea really needed also a large extent of social intelligence. And um, for instance, um, you know, even in very technical questions around how does one put together data sources that speaks to different levels of organization of the same plant and even environmental factors, 
And this is very important when you're trying to examine gene environmental interactions in this kind of research. Uh, it was important to try and mix quantitative observational and imaging data. This meant that uh, one needed common trait descriptors. And this meant that there needed to be some sort of agreement among stakeholders about what um, appropriate trait descriptors would be. It also meant that there needed to be metadata to inform the further contextualization of this data. And again, there needed to be agreement on what kind of metadata to use. But of course, this is a very difficult kind of consensus to achieve when the cultures of data exchange in this field are so widely diverse, both across the scales one is looking at. One goes from a little field uh, somewhere in a, in a small um, hold farming community in Nigeria, all the way to multinational corporations that control um, seed um, um, production in the majority of countries. And of course, across borders, we're, we're all any nation having different um, perceptions of how they want to think about agricultural development, and also uh, many international organizations being highly involved uh, in trying to regulate all of this and with their own stakes in this. And of course, uh, the domain between the, the, the relationship between public and private um, agencies in this space. And um, so actually finding, sharing access and reuse agreements among stakeholders becomes uh, very fraught. And so is defining appropriate data governance to define uh, what constitutes lawful and adequate data use in this case. This of course is complicated by the fact that uh, there is a strong interest right now in heritage crops, particularly those that come from the global south and have been uh, less studied and they're probably going to become much and much more relevant for sustenance and food security in the global north due to climate change. And in these cases, it's very important to try and acknowledge and reward the provenance of the data, the work made uh, by indigenous communities in producing uh, particular um, uh, specimens and particular breeds and also to allocate responsibility for what kind of uses are made of this data and being able to pinpoint mistakes and concerns. All of this is crucial to try and identify who is being excluded by these systems, who is not being rewarded appropriately and who is not being credited appropriately. Uh, but of course, as you can imagine, given the scales and the different interests involved uh, in this system, it becomes very complicated very quickly. So, there is a strong recognition that trying to compare and integrate data from across the globe is absolutely crucial to um, producing uh, good results in the area of agriculture and precision medicine. And there is a lot of emphasis on trying to develop global data infrastructures and related semantics. But uh, of course, that raises these questions around how do we acquire consensus to do this? So what kind of infrastructures are we looking at? Uh, very concretely, we've been working with um, Infrastructures which are uh, almost by definition transdisciplinary, they need to involve experts uh, from technical side, as well as from the domains, as well as on the territories and the types of crops that are involved here, as well as from um, the humanities and social sciences, as in my case, uh, who are looking at this from the perspective of what actually constitutes a sustainable infrastructure. And uh, these are also deliberately transnational initiatives, of course, and there's many of them. Uh, I've, I've cited them here. Um, if you want to have a look at them, um, uh, these are very much at the level of the FAO and uh, United Nations and similar initiatives uh, trying to really bring together uh, different types of uh, data stakeholders and have them communicate with each other. Now, of course, um, there are huge governance challenges in trying to do that. There is this underlying idea to many of these initiatives that what we're looking at is um, an idealization of global plant data resources as a common good that should be harnessed for the survival of humans and of the planet. But of course, there's no such thing as a global data resource. These are all highly local data resources. And whether or not it makes sense to conceptualize them as a common good is an incredibly fraught question. Um, Open data seem to be very important in this space, the fact that you can freely share the data. And yet, this is very tough uh, to reconcile with the fact that you've got to recognize the rights of indigenous groups and local breeders, particularly in a situation where these groups may not be very happy to share their data, especially not with uh, multinational corporations. And uh, indeed, also to reconcile this idea of openness with the fact that the vast majority of these data still are produced by plant dryers, which are sponsored by agrotech companies, and they're privately managed and completely inaccessible. 
So data governance is very often pointed to as a key to address these issues, but the question becomes governance among whom, established by whom, and in this sense, um, uh, again, we come back to this question of the, this being a huge socio-technical problem. Even the idea of what counts as data production in relation to crops is a very fraught issue um, because um, you can think, for instance, that data production is the result of growing plant specimens. That's when you're producing data, right? Or you could say, no, no, this is about when you select the specific strains uh, that data are going to be about. Everything else doesn't matter. Or you could say, no, actually, it's about when you design the field trials, because this is when you're actually setting up what will count as data for you. Ultimately, you're setting up your instruments and your methods. Or you can say, no, no, it's about the measurement tools you're using. This is really what's producing the data. So that's what you need to focus on. Or you can talk about who is designing data storage and data infrastructures for this data. All of these uh, ways of thinking about data production actually potentially could be equally valid. But depending on how you answer this question, you have different answers to the question of who is the legitimate owner of the data and who has actually control over their use. Right? And uh, the lack of clarity to key questions like this is what, in fact, leaves the door open to bioprospecting and to what some people are calling digital feudalism. So having uh, countries in the global north, whether publicly sponsored researchers or private companies that go to the global south and basically predate and appropriate all of the resources relating to plants. And this, of course, is certainly nothing new. It builds on certainly long exploitation and discrimination that is built in the very food production system that we use every day, everywhere in the world. So uh, to try and think about this question in a kind of slightly more uh, data-based way, this is going to be the only time where I'm showing you an attempt to do, a, in our own group, a very specific data-intensive exercise. Uh, we started to think about how to map uh, these data infrastructures. And um, we started with the idea of trying to map them geographically. And this, of course, this is all very preliminary. This is what that I'm doing with Hugh Williamson and Michelle During here at the University of Exeter. And it's very much in flux also because we're still trying to find uh, more funding for this. But the idea was, of course, try and locate them geographically. Most importantly, try and locate these initiatives uh, um, uh, diachronically. So thinking about the time at which different initiatives, which are which have a lot of responsibilities for how data are being um, mapped and uh, put together, have been, um, uh, uh, have been developed. Uh, when did this start? Who was involved in these initiatives? Which were key points of change within these initiatives? When were they discontinued? And so on and so forth. So you can see an example, for instance, one potential visualization of the timing of some of these initiatives here. And of course, uh, we are compiling um, profiles of each institution and platform that we are looking at so that we can start to put uh, these elements together. Of course, this is uh, far from being something that we can already do a lot of uh, data intensive analysis on, but the intention is uh, eventually to be able to do this. And partly this is because there's been a lot of work actually done within the plant sciences themselves on mapping um, data infrastructures and initiatives, much, much better than anything we may be doing here, which is already anyhow very limited to the ones that we are in intersected with. Um, but what is really lacking is a more historical perspective on uh, these kinds of issues. Helen Curry at the University of Cambridge is doing wonderful work trying to supply some of this, and many other people are uh, thankfully participating. But I think this is a space where data intensive approaches could really be helpful um, to, to further these kinds of studies. So. When it comes to these studies of uh, research initiatives and data-centric initiatives um, around the world and in different domains, what kind of solutions um, did we come up with and what kind of things have been um, discussing with these different stakeholders when uh, thinking about what could be done to improve the current situation? Well, first of all, of course, uh, the idea that data stewardship should be valued and should try and foster critical data reuse. So uh, rather than just black boxing and um, whatever has been happening to the data and producing nice visualizations that actually cannot be unpacked and disaggregated, it's really important to provide tools to be able to go back to um, analyze steps of data processing and data visualization and potentially question them. Partly because, of course, you know, as I've been saying, the context of uh, data use is going to be really important in determining what matters about the data and what we really want to look at. And of course, also trying to build responsible practices 
into technical specifications of data infrastructures. There are principles that are being put forward, uh, certainly in, um, in the general sciences around this, the so-called care and trust principles. We can come back to this in discussion if you want. Um, but this seems to be a very important thing to try and do. We are right now in the middle actually of carrying out a big workshop where we're trying to put together stakeholders to um, uh, try and push this a little bit along. And the idea that data providers and users should really be involved in the development of data infrastructures is absolutely fundamental. That came out from pretty much every study I've done in a qualitative sense in this area. And uh, there are initiatives in relation to crops uh, that are trying to stimulate that so-called communities of practice. And there is in fact a big exercise at the FAO right now to try and see what this kind of long-term involvement could be and how it can be uh, incentivized. And of course, more generally, and this really brings us back to what uh, we are doing in HPS, is trying to encourage as explicit as a debate as possible over what are the overarching goals and, in fact, what are the concepts of human development that underpin data sharing practices. And certainly in the case of uh, crop data, this is absolutely essential because, uh, as some of you will be aware, there are very particular ways of thinking about what constitutes agricultural development that tend to take all of the attention and not even be questioned uh, by people who are working in this field. And that um, has potentially really uh, dramatic and um, bad results. So now uh, let's think a little bit briefly about looking into the future. And um, I think uh, it's pretty clear from what I've been saying so far that one of the things that has gotten more and more um, relevant for me in thinking about these problems is the question of inequity, injustice and exclusion in digital systems and from digital systems. And also the fact that um, the ways in which the system try and, and encompass and capture environmental variability is extremely diverse and uh, in very, very often very problematic because variability happens at many, many different scales and um, this needs to be recognized into these systems. And um, these two things I think are related. The fact that we have limited ways of recognizing environmental variability is actually, in my view, deeply linked to the kind of exclusions and digital divides that are happening in, in the contemporary um, digital uh, realm. And so I'm, like in the coming year, I will be starting a five-year research project looking specifically at what does it mean to think about open science in a situation where you have very highly diverse research environments where this notion would actually signify different things for different people, especially when it comes to the sharing of data systems. And I've done some work over the last year, as you would expect, and probably many of you have had that preoccupation on uh, how does one think about these ideas in the case of the current COVID crisis and the pandemic. And certainly it's important to mention this at the moment because the pandemic has brought an incredible acceleration of digital transformation. Those uh, of us who were already in a digital realm somewhat have been absolutely, um, you know, um, pushed forward enormously. And there is a lot of evidence of uh, the penetration of um, digital services, decentralization of infrastructures uh, around the world and particularly in the global north. And of course, this is further amplified by the launch of the 5G networks. Uh, at the same time, there is also a very strong recognition of the fact that this is in fact amplifying the digital divide to an incredible extent, because people who have been excluded from digital transformations at the beginning of the pandemic are now finding themselves excluded from any kind of social or medical assistance, because now many of these services start to pass, like the, for instance, digital passport, uh, if you've been immunized, start to pass through these digital systems. And so uh, the World Economic Forum has put out this wonderful idea of the Great Reset. We need to think about digital uh, platforms um, so that we have a new social contract that honors the dignity of every human being. And this was specifically to try and address the marginalization that exists in this sphere. But in fact, uh, even here, we've seen enormously an emphasis on the technical as a great solution, as an alternative to tackling the much more difficult questions around uh, social conditions. And so across different countries at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a rush towards data science solutions like tracing apps on smartphones, trying to do data aggregation across countries. And of course, uh, this increased capacity in already very powerful big um, technology corporations like uh, Apple and Google who provided the technology for some of this. And again, it decreased even more uh, capacity in low resource environment that arguably would need it most. 
uh, which uh, br brought me to uh, have a preliminary assessment of this great idea of the Great Reset as a combination of surveillance capitalism and some sort of lip service to social responsibility, certainly not something that has really helped much to improve the situation. And again, I think this has pointed us to, to the fragility of the system. There's, there's huge limits to data access still, even when it comes to COVID-related data, we've seen it happening from the medical frontline, social services, tracing, and data interoperability and linkage are not working very well, um, even now. It also highlighted the problematic relationship between different governments, governments and corporations, and the role of international agencies like the WHO, and of course the dire consequences of using uh, digital platforms for surveillance and the lack of trust of people who are exposed to these kinds of systems. I think particularly one thing that I want to really highlight here, again, it's absolutely trivial, hopefully, for this uh, audience, but I think it's really worth repeating again, the fact that when we're doing digital studies, there is this lure of neutrality that comes from using some of these uh, technologies. And, you know, hopefully we're all very aware of the fact that data science and digital studies are not neutral, they're everything but. And unfortunately, especially data science as a field, keeps uh, very often selling itself as a neutral field that can be put to the service of different masters, uh, needs must, right? And I think this is really problematic. We've had a big discussion uh, very recently in the Harvard Data Science Review on this uh, point where I published a paper that was then commented on by lots of uh, different experts in the field coming from different domains. And uh, it's quite an interesting exchange if you want to have a look at it, uh, trying to consider what does it mean to move away from the lure of neutral and value-free data science and instead work collaboratively with domain experts and communities towards forging socially beneficial solutions in a very explicit way. So let's uh, spend just a few minutes on implications for HPS. I think I've been hopefully pointing to that as I was going along and taking you on this tour of uh, data studies um, in research. And uh, one of the sets of arguments I've been making over and over, and, and again, apologies for those of you who have heard it before, is that situating data, analyzing data is a, a practice of valuing, right? And it's unavoidably so. The procedures through which data are processed and ordered crucially affect their interpretation. I hope that at least the quick examples I gave are enough to give you a sense of this, and it will be also part of your experience. And of course, databases do not store some sort of ready-made facts. It is the value, it is the ways in which a evidential value is attributed to data that determines the epistemic significance of data towards knowledge claims. And of course, this evidential value is not just determined by scientific or intellectual considerations. It also depends on other forms of value in data that can range from affective forms, you like a certain data type more than another, economic, uh, for instance, access to data, uh, personal considerations and cultural considerations. Uh, one argument I've been giving in giving a philosophical reading of this work is that the triangulation of data, which is typically seen as one of the great solutions to try and make data sets better, does not actually reliably counter the kind of bias that we see in the data landscape. And um, because it doesn't really counter necessarily the bias introduced by the diverse methods of data collection, storage, dissemination, visualization, because these are already sitting within a highly layered and unequal landscape. And of course, in all of this, uh, one of the conclusions for me is that pluralism in methods and standards enormously contributes robustness to data analysis and reduces the loss of system specific knowledge. Um, also, a, a big lesson for me in doing this work has been the role of interdisciplinarity and wide engagement on data sources and analysis. Of course, multidisciplinary teams are indispensable. Many of you are already working in this way. It's certainly been my experience that I you know, understand very little of many aspects of uh, the things I'm uh, trying to analyze and research. And so I hugely benefit from a wide network of collaborators and friends and peers uh, that uh, provides me with input and feedback on what actually is important here. And this is particularly important when trying to understand the context and social significance of the data. And to do that, of course, is also very important to try and engage beyond uh, professional research per se. In many cases, this can add data to what one is doing. It also can add robustness to existing data and help to contextualize and validate the interpretation of data. So 
I want to come back very briefly in the context of APS to the kind of solutions I've hinted at uh, before and when thinking about more uh, scientific efforts in, in uh, trying to manage and uh, reinterpret big data and see how we fare when we look at those same criteria. So the first solution I'd put forward, of course, it, it, these are in no way meant to be comprehensive or exhaustive or anything like that, right? But the first idea was the idea that data stewardship is needed to foster critical data reuse. What does it mean for us? Well, first of all, I think for many people in HPS still, probably all of you excluded, <laughs> but there is a strong need to recognize what counts as data and why. And this, uh, I think, should happen in a relational framing, so really recognizing what is it that you're using as evidence and acknowledging the fact that, in fact, whatever it is that you're using as evidence, in fact, is really counting as a form of data for your research. And therefore, that some of these considerations actually apply um, rather than uh, being something that one can just discard. Having, of course, an explicit debate on which data get to travel and why. This is particularly important when we're looking at historical archives, where, of course, we have a huge path dependence about what is being recorded, which figures are being given prominence, which kinds of journals, for instance, are being uh, tracked and which not, you know, um, the relevance of languages here is very important. So uh, for instance, the work that Christophe Malater was presenting two days ago is absolutely wonderful in that way. But basically try and keep questioning uh, sources and also the ways in which data have been processed in time. And this also means when we are uh, processing data ourselves, try to make our own data processing as trackable as possible, right? Provide people who are looking at our data visualizations or at our papers with um, some indication about how they can deconstruct our arguments and our visualizations and uh, go back to thinking with us and potentially thinking differently from us about how we're using our data sources. And this is something I try to do for qualitative data. So I've been uh, publishing, of course, with a lot of work on the ethics of this, publishing some of the transcript that came out of uh, the interviews I've been carrying out on Zenodo, uh, one of the big repositories um, held by CERN. And I will certainly continue to do this on a larger scale as I continue um, empirical research in these kinds of fields. But it's just a small step, of course, and there's a lot of work still to be done about how do we set up our own infrastructures to make data journeys trackable. Um, think about how much standardization do we really need and how this sits compared to local solutions adopted by specific, specific, um, sorry, specific communities and domains in dealing with the same data. And, uh, and of course, uh, Bacchus Turner, for instance, talked about this when he was talking about the ambiguity of standards and, in fact, how um, fruitful it can be to really um, build on that uh, when we're thinking about data infrastructures. And of course, think about values as much as possible. Think about the labor systems that we're using for responsible sharing and the implications that uh, sharing certain data can have in a much broader sense than just our research. And this brings me to the second point, which is building responsible practice into technical specifications of data infrastructures. Well, I think that actually there continues to be relatively little work in HPS on the ethics of data sharing. Thankfully, many of you uh, touched upon this in presentations uh, during this um, conference, but I think even in HPS, there actually still is a strong attention on the technical side, which is not necessarily matched by attention to the uh, side of responsible innovation, what does it mean to actually share this data ethically? And one of the big components of this, of course, is to think very carefully about which services we are actually using. What are we relying upon when we're doing this work? Are we using Amazon Web Services? Are we using Google Cloud? What kind of software? What kind of platforms? What implication does this have? I think Sarah Davis started to point in that direction on her talk about uh, Twitter as a platform. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done, especially in HPS, to really um, start to get a better awareness of what this means. And of course, that extends to publications and the whole question around a uh, potential open access and, and dissemination of our own research results in our own journals and in our own book series. And it's very important to recognize this early and places at the heart of technical work. And there are questions around how principles that have been um, trialed uh, in the space of the natural sciences could actually apply to work in HPS. And I think that's, that's a long discussion. I'm not going to spend much time on this now because I'm almost at the end of my talk. Um, and of course, there is a question around um, potentially being careful around uh, discussions around open science, but also being careful to problematize the idea that open science is always democratic and a wonderful thing. 
Um, in fact, I think this is not always the case. And especially when it comes to data sharing, we need to pay a lot of attention to what we are sharing and how. Third solution that we have looked at is the long-term involvement of data providers. This is, of course, particularly relevant for those of us who work with living actors, people who are still alive and want to document their work, or uh, we're investigating research practices which are now ongoing. So what could the direct engagement with uh, these uh, objects of our work look like? What benefits would it bring? And I think these are very important questions, at least to ask, even if one has uh, no resources to really uh, put this in um, emotion in one's own work. Certainly what I've seen in my own work over the years is that when I studied many of my um, investigations by just looking in, right, just being a participant observant to some scientific initiatives, very often I've become part of them. And now I would consider uh, many of them to be collaborations rather than just case studies. And that's an interesting shift, which comes with all sorts of interesting accountabilities, problems, but also advantages. And of course, a big question uh, for all of you who are historians is uh, how does that apply to historical sources, if at all? And of course, a bigger question here is how do we choose the topics that we're gonna be investigating? Um, who do we talk to? Which audiences do we have in mind? Which implications do these choices of audience and public actually have? Fourth point, and this hopefully should be the strongest point for our field, is to try and encourage debate over overarching goals and concepts of human development underpinning data sharing practices. And of course, uh, I think in digital studies, we're all pretty good at trying to um, think about this in relation to some of the sources we're using and maybe the practices that we're analyzing. The question is, how does this apply to our own work, of course? And I think this is really an important question for all of us to think about. And with this, I'll finally stop talking. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to a discussion. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um... While I wait on, on people to post their questions as the, as the tape delay catches up with us, I wanted to ask, this is, this is related to, to something you were just touching on at the very end. So I've been interested in, in, in these kinds of questions for, for, for a while now, especially these questions about involving, uh, involving various kinds of stakeholders. And I wanted to ask you, so because I think you're better positioned than probably anybody I know to answer this question. Um, how have you and how do you think we ought to engage these processes of building trust? Because I think that's so often at the heart, they see someone, you know, a population sees someone coming out of an academic research unit looking to talk about big data, right? And the shields go up and they probably should, right? So what has that, what has that trust building process been like? And, and, and I'm, I'm wondering what, what kind of thoughts you might have to share about it. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much, Charles. It's a complex question, of course, uh, because one has to be careful too, because it is true that partly because um, of the way in which research is organized at the moment and valued, uh, the work that we do in terms of uh, looking at the meta level of what's going on in research is actually not valued at all, as it should, uh, I would argue, and I think many of you would agree with me. And so we're always starting from as the underdog <laughs> in this kind of collaboration. Certainly, you know, is, anthropologists would call this studying up very often, particularly when we are involved in collaborations with with a very prominent scientist or kind of um, or uh, local context. And um, I think, well, first of all, I mean, of course, it completely depends on the very specifics of the research. That's partly why I wasn't trying to give too detailed precepts here because it will change enormously given uh, the situation one is in. I can give a, a couple of examples from my own uh, experience. Uh, so um, certainly the fact that I have built up a kind of um, you know, even just a track record <laughs> of working with some communities and um, spending, in fact, um, many, many years in uh, sitting in committees and helping out and kind of, you know, um, being part of the service structure of some communities it ended up giving me also more credibility when it came to have discussions with people uh, around uh, the topics I was interested in and um, what they would think about this and how we could think about working on this together. And um, so indeed, there is a lot of personal work, I think, involved in, in setting up these networks of trust. But once these are, you know, a few of them are kind of on their way, um, that seems to then be, become easier just because you're slightly better recognized as somebody who can be useful in that way. And it turns out, uh, at least for pretty much all of the domains I've been working with, um, people can be um, 
doubtful or a little bit worried indeed, as you said, uh, when they see um, people who do digital studies who start to muck around their field. But my absolutely overwhelming experience is uh, a lot of interest and gratitude over, in, in, almost um, about the fact that there was that interest and um, you know, there was an opening to try and discuss things. And of course, I've also had my share of big critiques and um, big clashes with people. Some of them were very useful to me because I think potentially I really could have done things better to prevent that and to have preliminary discussions that would have avoided uh, the need for that kind of big dissent. In other cases, just the, the nature of the game. And certainly now that I'm doing um, research fields which are very politicized, there's absolutely no way you can avoid it, right? So there's, there's also that question. And, but again, there's also that also then becomes a question around um, building up um, an awareness and reflexivity about who are the audiences that interest you, right? Because I think for me that has really expanded in the course of the last few years. So I, I started, you know, my big aim, like maybe 10, 15 years ago, was to be able to talk to the people that were doing the semantics for data infrastructure, because I thought this is amazing, they're changing the way we science is done, this is really where theory is, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, so very coherently with my own philosophical framework, I spent it a lot of time <laughs> um, trying to understand what they were doing and talk to them and understand how they were thinking and, and, and try and think about what this meant philosophically. And, but as I got more and more exposed to some of the implications of adopting those frameworks in terms of, you know, um, you know, the inequity that data resources can cause, that also shifted um, my attention to publics. And to be honest, it's also a question of uh, very often being invited uh, to sit in committees. You know, it's, it's bizarre, like at one point you start to realize, in fact, that there are more publics than you thought. And so it's a whole, it's, I regard it as part of the exploratory work of research that is wonderful, that you keep discovering new people that you didn't know existed and have jobs that you didn't know existed. And in fact, turned out to be really, really important for the kind of things you're interested in. So, you know, it's, I'm sorry, it's not a very uh, systematic answer, but at least a flavor. No, that's real. No, that's, that's super helpful. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I think, I think we often tend to, we tend to underestimate some of the, uh, these advantages, well, for uh, to put it briefly, the advantages of showing up, right, especially in these, as well as in these kind of service-based contexts that, that that may not get the kind of uh, uh, recognition that that other that other enga scholarly engagements do. Uh, let me get to questions. So, uh, Eugenio Petrovich asks, uh, do you think that uh, the same kinds of ethical issues, inequity, injustice, and exclusion uh, regarding data in biosciences or in medicine concern also the data that are used in digital humanities, considering that you know, perhaps digital humanities arguably have a significantly lower impact on the future of humanity than, than the biosciences? Well, um, thanks a lot for the question. I think that's for all of you to answer in a sense. Uh, I, was, I was trying to be provocative and just get you to think about this. And I think when it comes to uh, the work I'm involved in, which is in a sense, you could qualify it as digital studies of science. There, there are very, very big uh, questions. And I think, in fact, that field is coextensive uh, with the scientific work itself. And in fact, uh, I may even go as far as to say that in, in, some, in some respects, it has even more responsibility because, um, you know, while, of course, many people would just not care about what we're doing, of course, but there's also a sense in which we very often end up speaking for a certain field when examining particular questions, and we end up providing a particular reading of what's going on, for instance, when um, people are analyzing metabolism and um, across different crop species, uh, what is the relevance of thinking about a particular structural gene environment uh, interactions when um, producing a crop that's going to be drought, drought resistance. Um, you know, like what, um, how do we think about modeling uh, in COVID vaccination, something that many people are doing at the moment as work. I mean, these are all examples of work that can be done very usefully with the help of digital methods, uh, which help you to scope what's going on in the world, help you to um, spot different trends, identify who are the interesting actors, extend your vision in so many different ways. But at the same time, when you are presenting it, or at least uh, when, you know, I think in, in HPB, Eastern <laughs> Philosophy of Biology, when we do this kind of work, we also are really providing an important source of representation for a full domain. And almost by definition, that work involves a lot of exclusion and a lot of selection, right? And I'm thinking also, I mean, the work of my collaborators, Mike Dietrich and uh, Rachel Ankeny, who have used a lot of digital study 
a type of approaches to um, look at the mapping of the use of different organisms around the world. I mean, that has had a huge impact because people look at that work and think, ha, huh, look, these researchers have done this work and they say that my organism is particularly important or my organism actually hasn't been important enough or blah, 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 right? And, and this has implications for sure. So I think uh, digital humanities can have a very big impact in that sense. Of course, some fields will be less impactful than, than the others. It's also a question about whether you want to uh, participate in, in, in um, projects which have those um, connotations, but I certainly don't think that digital humanities are excluded from this. Whether the same ethical uh, principles and questions that arise from the sciences really are valid, from um, digital studies that I'm less sure about. And I think there's a need to be a lot of work on this. As I said, I really don't think there's been enough work on this question. I think when it comes to HPS, I've tried to point to some of the specificities of what's going on in my field. And um, I'm sure there's, there's much, much more that can be said on this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be great to see more discussion happening um, in that sense. I think sometimes we almost give for granted that because we're all humanists, we're good people. And anyhow, nobody cares about what we do. And so that's fine. Ethics is not that relevant because it's in our DNA. I hate that expression, but anyway, I used it anyhow. But, um, but yeah, but you see what I mean. Well, I think actually, potentially there's even bigger risks uh, precisely because we tend to overlook this. That's really nice. That's really nice. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Rose Trappis asks, let me get to the next question. Rose Trappis says, uh, asks, have you been able to affect any changes in these communities or systems that you've been working with? And how did that work? What was the, what was the change generation process like? Yeah, I got that question actually very, very recently, yesterday, as a matter of fact, from a group of students. So um, I think that's a very interesting question, especially because it points to one of the problems with incentives. The fact that impact, whichever way you want to define it in these kinds of fields, is really difficult to track, right? And that means that responsibilities and accountabilities are also very difficult to track, right? Precisely because things are so distributed. That's precisely the problem. is a, a double-faced um, problem. On one end, responsibilities becomes more diluted, more difficult to track. At the very same time, potential positive change also uh, becomes uh, problematic to track, right? So, I mean, could I say that the work I've been doing has made a big impact? It's very hard to say. I mean, I suppose the one, the, the work which I did, which I'm pretty sure had some impact in a kind of more blah, verifiable way, um, because we're using it for the research excellence framework in my university at the moment, is when I ended up um, doing a lot of work for the European Commission on the basis of the insights I've gotten from my research. But in fact, uh, doing that work meant for me spending a, an inordinate amount of time thinking about how does one present results which are originally thought for an HPS audience, for a public which is completely different and is interested in what constitutes sustainable data infrastructures, right? Which I would argue, and I've argued quite vocally, was incredibly useful for me as a researcher because it really did shift some of the ways in which I was thinking about my philosophical frameworks. It shifted some of the ways in which I was thinking about my historical sources. So, you know, I certainly I would recommend that kind of engagement as a, as a way to become a better researcher, really, like not just because, you know, you're doing good or you're doing bad or whatever it is that you're doing in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, then you have other types of interactions that give you some sense of impact, wherever you want to define it. So I, I tend to do a lot of collaborations, even with small startups and people who are working for instance, on data centric systems um, in genomics or sometimes in clinical spaces. Um, I tend to talk, actually, I'm, I'm quite happy to talk, um, you know, like in a, in a very independent um, basis as an independent expert with groups of people working in companies in the private sector uh, to think about how some of these really big ethical issues apply to the sector, because I think when it comes to these studies, if, if you don't do that, it's, it's, it's almost a problem because this is where, certainly for contemporary data work, most of our uh, materials are filtered through if it doesn't come directly from there. And um, I've been writing reports for governments specifically uh, that were then used to produce policy. So for me, you know, these are things that I'm interested in doing, but I think, um, you know, like what I'm hoping for the project that I'm starting gonna start next year, is that we're gonna to start to get a better sense of um, you know, these kinds of engagements and what they lead to, because we're actually, for the first time, I'm really uh, bringing in people who are working on different data infrastructures around the world, and especially in the Global South, as uh, partners in the project from the very beginning. 
And so part of this will be to see actually how the group develops and uh, what changes in us and then and, you know, and in the different people involved from the different domains as, as a result of this exercise. I am, um, uh, you probably many of you will hate me for this, but I'm uh, very allergic to quantification of impact. I really don't think it works very well. I know that many is very important for this community, but I've yet to see an example where this works particularly well for this kind of diffuse distributed practices. And so, yeah, so I haven't particularly thought about or been willing to think about how we could quantify this. But of course, it's a big discussion and that's something that a lot of um, governments and organizations are looking for now. So any insight from all of you on this would be great. Great, thanks. Um, more questions. Next up is from uh, Christophe Malater, who says, uh, extremely inspiring talk, Sabina, thanks so much. Uh, I have a question about the Dataverse or repository type services that we're starting to see appear for academics. So it's a real jungle out there with services offered by large institutes, some of the best funded universities like Harvard, some traditional publishers, some online publishers. Uh, what are your thoughts about these? Yeah, I mean, in, in short, it's a freaking nightmare. That's my thought about this. <laughs> in the sense that, I mean, you know, I, I just find it rather, you know, let's just say paradoxical, not to use um, a bad word, but the fact that you spend 15, 20 years thinking about data infrastructure, trying to get information about them, trying to dig into their history, understand how they're being set up, and then you still don't understand what's going on in your own field, which I think would accurately depict my situation. So, uh, you know, I try to follow this up. Every time I start a new project, I try to have um, a month where all together with the team, we think about, okay, where are we now? what's around, what's available to us, uh, what can we choose? And I mean, it's, it's <laughs> again, pointers a direction I will be benefiting from because, you know, I've been doing this as I'm, I'm um, at one point I had a slide where I was referring to this paper we did for the plant community together with, and this was a paper that I co-authored with some of the top experts in that community that were dealing with data infrastructures. I had spent 15 years in like, investigating the community and their data infrastructure and mapping them. And it was ridiculously difficult to put together that paper to the point that we ended up just with some headline kinds of data infrastructures because going anywhere further than that was already a nightmare. And then uh, for years after that, I received emails with people complaining saying, yeah, but this and no, but that. And in fact, this really wasn't accurate and et cetera, et cetera. So mapping this, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real difficulty. What I tend to do now is when it comes to open data, I quite like for now the Zenodo approach because I think, um, I mean, my impression, and again, you could uh, think very differently, but our impression is that in this field, our data curation practices are still very much in fluctuation. There is very little, if any, agreement on what they look like. In fact, there's been very little discourse. I mean, I think this conference will hopefully kick off the discourse around how on earth we're doing this, but everybody's doing their own thing. And so having a repository which is open access is financed by the European Commission, which means that is hopefully as long term as it can be uh, and, um, and provides you free hosting for whichever data type you want to put out in whichever format you want to put out is pretty important as a first step. Of course, I mean, I'm the first to say that this is really not solving the problem because this stuff is almost by definition not machine readable, uh, like, it, you know, there's no standards for metadata much. Um, but again, the services I've seen in the UK being developed for social science work, for instance, have not really been great, uh, I have to say. I mean, the, I found them very restrictive for my research. So it's a struggle, um, uh, certainly. When it comes to cloud services, it's even worse because, of course, we're all uh, working in institutions which make very particular decisions, which you know, I've tried to influence and uh, you know, I've chaired the research data management of my university in the last year and a half, and I still haven't managed to influence um, which provider we were going for and which people were trying to get uh, some you know, quotes from when it came to choosing um, cloud services and anything like that, because of course this is about IT, so you know, we are totally excluded from this thing. So it's hard because there you enter into this realm of incredible labyrinth of codependencies where our own space of agency is very limited. But again, I think you know, there's, uh, there's still things we can do. I mean, you know, we can use certain kinds of um, reference um, uh, tools, for instance, which may be open access, at least for now. Uh, we can try, you know, we can think about, as I, as I referred to before, one of the things that I think is really most accessible to us now is thinking about where we publish. Uh, because contrary to the, 
infrastructure question where, because we're a very small field, we sort of depend on a lot of what other people are doing ultimately. I think publication is where um, there can be change happening. I mean, I've been part of discussions about this for quite a while also, because I've been very actively involved in open access, open science discourse. And, you know, I, for me, for instance, in the history, in historians community, I think there's a disappointing uh, lack of attention to, um, for instance, the question of open access and what it means and what it signifies. There's a lot of backlash against Plan S, for instance, but I've seen less discussion on why we actually want it. <laughs> and I can tell you, I really want it. I want to be able to publish for free and to, for my work to be distributed to all the people that may be interested in this, um, you know, partly because I'm interested in having different publics. So I think, uh, you know, I, there's no obvious solutions there either because it's a very fraught discussion, no business model there either. I mean, the whole thing is difficult, but at least to make sure that our own scholarly societies, our own colleagues are aware of this problem and keep discussing it, I think will really um, make a difference. That's great, thank you. Um, let me see, I'll scroll down to check on votes. Uh, yes, next next, uh, next question up is from uh, Johan Munsey, who says, absolutely amazing talk. Uh, very helpful to understand your, your involvement and your, your deep analysis of data. I'd like to see how your conclusions impact studies on modeling of data and algorithmic opacity. Do you think that opacity of models of data built mostly with AI-based algorithms is related to your discussion on, on responsibility and accountability? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, that's a very good question also because I've got a few PhD students who are very deeply involved in this because we are running a, cent a doctoral center for AI and uh, environmental intelligence here. So it's a, it's a constant uh, question. Now, um, I mean, my feeling is actually that um, there is only so much we can do about the opacity and explicability of algorithms. Um, for reasons that are kind of obvious, uh, that uh, there's a sense in which, um, you know, I mean, they, they're almost, you know, these algorithms develop by themselves in a sense. So there's only so much we can do in explaining exactly how they obtain certain results. Uh, the system is so incredibly distributed. So, um, you know, the idea, you know, the old idea of scientific understanding that I worked on uh, when I was younger, like in, in thinking that you can capture and really, uh, you have the cognitive ability to understand um, like the, the whole system that you're working with, I think we just have to throw it out of the window. This is just not gonna happen. Um, but um, what I think is useful is to, um, for, first of all, for people who are involved in this kind of work to take it very seriously, because I really do believe that people who are uh, technically involved in producing the maths and the models for AI are absolutely on the front line of thinking about these issues. And I teach, I'm just finishing teaching a 200 strong uh, postgraduate class in data scientists. And I just finished writing a textbook actually specifically for that audience, partly because I really do think that um, a lot of the change will need to come from there because these are actually the people who have the enough level of technical understanding to potentially be able to see the implications of some of the very, very technical decisions. I mean, which prior do you put to a particular model? Uh, you know, how do you set up uh, the maths? Like all these kinds of things. I mean, these are important components. And, and the other thing I've been um, thinking about a lot and trying to recommend also in writing is a, a governance system where people who are dealing with producing this kind of algorithms and applying them are in regular communication with a broader set of stakeholders. And this is not because that means that we will be able to predict exactly what kind of impact benefits and harms can be uh, done through these technologies. I mean, that's completely impossible. It's never happened in the history of science and technology. And I really would like to see a system that tells me exactly how people are gonna be using my technology in five years time. I mean, that would be amazing. Uh, it's not gonna happen, but I think the closest um, tool that we have is to try and multiply the feedback that we get uh, when we are setting up certain systems and indeed exercise our ability to try and um, get walk other people through what that system can do. So I think this maybe gets close to the explicability idea, except that I don't think about explicability as, you know, you sit down and tell me exactly what's happening in every part of the algorithm and what's gonna happen as a result. I don't think that's possible and feasible in most of these systems, but the ability to get a group together of people who are working on these technologies and people who are using them on a regular basis, that's very important, and try and see how things are moving. And I mean, what I witness is that this has been beneficial to the groups I've been working with. Uh, just this very, you know, simple, stupid <laughs> kind of um, social trick of just trying to get people to articulate what they're doing and what they think at this moment, the potential implications could be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 
I certainly am a bit skeptical, though I think it's very important um, for modelers to think about um, technical ways of fixing these issues in the system. I think the trick is really constantly comparing these technical fixes with broader perceptions of what the social implications could be. So never to quite focus only on the technical side, but embed it all the time in, in a broader context. And of course that requires a lot of resources and it requires time, which a lot of people who are developing algorithms um, you know, are, have a lot of pressure about. So it's, it, it's obviously a very utopic idea of trying to rethink the system. At the same time, you know, I've been arguing that even with the, in the context of the COVID uh, crisis, which arguably really is an emergency, um, there has been a lot of work that was done far too fast, lots of algorithms implemented without really properly doing this kind of work, and that was a disaster. It was basically a waste of time. So it would have been better to take a bit of time to set it up um, more appropriately and set up these feedback mechanisms more appropriately. That's great. Thank you. Um, Next question coming in. Actually, so what was he? We have six. We have six minutes, and we have two. We have two questions that are actually nicely, uh, uh, slightly related to one another. So let me start. Yeah, let me start with uh, with one from Stefan Linquist who asks. Uh, so I'm interested in cases where there's a questionable ontological or perhaps uh, ethical position that influences the way that data are collected and then becomes reified further along in the, in the data journeys. As it strikes me as a potentially common phenomenon, it's also a place where philosophers of science might, might make interventions. So uh, uh, could you comment on how this, how this process could be effectively critiqued, perhaps? Yeah, that's a very live question. Thank you very much. Um, because right now we are dealing with uh, specifically agricultural systems. And this is a space where on one hand, I've been very interested in some local practices um, set up with specific local communities like uh, my colleagues in Nigeria, for instance, where there's been a real and serious attempt um, to try and engage local breeders and local communities in thinking about what counts as a relevant plant trait which of course, uh, you know, for many people is uh, also a basis of livelihood. Uh, there are considerations around how do different plants taste when they're cooked. Uh, you know, there's considerations around the role of plants culturally, the role of plants as a food system. And very often these are exactly the considerations that uh, more standard taxonomic systems don't take into account. And so already there, uh, I was very interested in looking at the ways in which these different standards start to clash. But partly that's why I got involved and interested in the crop ontology, because I thought that was an interesting situation where you're trying to at least engender a dialogue between these different taxonomic systems and see what comes out of it and whether you can actually use in a productive way uh, synonyms, for instance, and the multiplicity and the potential for multiplication that you have in a digital system and in an internet system to acknowledge different perspectives, at least, and make it possible not to lose them completely uh, when you're putting together a set of standards, right? So that was one. But of course, um, you know, one looks at these kinds of initiatives, I'm still very interested in, I think they're wonderful. Many of them then end up uh, subsiding under an umbrella set of initiatives that are supposed to provide this kind of transnational global interoperability. And these initiatives, lo and behold, they all come from the global north, they all come from very particular institutions, you know, they're very particular partners, and they have a particular interest that they need to satisfy to be able to work, right? And this is, you know, you may think that this is just a cynical remark, but in fact, it's not just a cynical remark, it's a very important remark, because the fact is that, you know, whether we like it or not, the majority of plant crop trials uh, for production of new food varieties and you know, um, uh, crop varieties and, and food security are done by private companies. So to so actually, let, let me jump in because you've just perfectly yeah. set up the last question. So let me feed the last question into exactly the thought that you're having right now. So uh, Arlie Belvo asks, would, would strengthening data standards and infrastructures for data sharing and collaboration protect and empower communities and indigenous groups? So is there a risk that uh, that kind of system that's being abused by more powerful organizations like Amazon or Monsanto? So there's a question about gaming the system here, right? If uh, we had a conversation some yesterday about the risk of making the Google search algorithms public, making them gameable, is there the same kind of worry exactly right here. So this, I think this is exactly where you're going. So of course, wanted of to course, add that. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Of course. Uh, right. I mean, there's no question. And I mean, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, it would be very problematic for anybody who works in digital studies, not to start their work from the assumption that we are in an, in the context of a highly exploitative, aggressive um, data system. 
uh, where, which is absolutely vastly dominated by specific private interests. And I'm not against the fact that they're private per se, I'm against you know, the, the way in which these have been fed into a kind of completely neoliberal kind of ultra capitalist way of thinking about data value. So of course, in that kind of system, there are problems, right? And in the area I'm working in, which indeed, as, as Charles was saying, this is exactly what I was going in the previous answer, right? So in the area I'm working in, uh, not only you have this issue on the side of data facilities, but you have the issue of uh, corporate interests and very particular ontologies of what it means to think about agricultural development coming from the history of agriculture and all the international organizations, national, international, uh, national boards, national standards, all the rest of it that regulate not just agriculture, but uh, the selling and trading of seeds, um, you know, the standards for fertilization, all of those things, right? So, yeah, so it's kind of, um, you know, so I think in, in that situation, um, that's where, again, start recognizing the, distribu the distributed nature of these systems is really important. And that doesn't mean that you don't recognize power relations in all of this. That's where I really detach myself from network network theory. I mean, I'm not interested in just looking at networks and flattening things out. And um, I think it's very important for data studies to uh, not ever flatten power relations out because they're kind of absolutely central to these kinds of systems. Um, what do you do as a philosopher if you're interested in changing the ontology or some of these discussions in changing the standards? Uh, if I knew, <laughs> I'll be really happy. <laughs> but I've certainly been trying uh, with some of these things um, for a while. So now, for instance, we are working with um, agricultural development and many of the standards there that rely on this idea of genetic gain as a measure for what does it mean to have development in the area, which basically is the high yield um, notion of agriculture, which I think you know, we're all familiar with the fact that this may be exactly controversial, at least in some, um, in some uh, environments. And yet it is the absolutely predominant idea that drives uh, most of the ways in which different national governments are thinking about cultural development. So yeah, um, I think it's an interesting way to infiltrate the system, to try and think about how from the technical level we could try and de-reify <laughs> some of these issues and try and, and um, add multiplicity and more ambiguity indeed, uh, like into the systems and um, in the awareness of the fact that, um, yeah, the interdependencies are huge in cases like this and uh, nobody of us, you know, I mean, it'd be great if some of us managed to really break a system completely in that way. I, I you know, I think it's probably gonna be a little unlikely, but it's also true that, you know, when Barry Smith, um, basically became the protagonist, at least for a while, of the development of bioontologies, the kind of platonic assumptions that he managed to impart on that field, which of course have been a very strong critic of now for a while, have really lived in that field and have had lots of implications. So hey, <laughs> these really are spaces where philosophers, historians, social scientists can make an impact if they arrive in the right moment at the right time. Uh, on that, yeah, on that cautiously hopeful possible. note, I, I'm afraid I have to bring our discussion to a close, but thank you so much. This was a really fantastic talk. Thanks so much for sharing, for sharing your work and your thoughts about uh, uh, a hopeful, a hopeful if problematic future. Uh, I'm excited to see how things unfold over the next